to tell to one of the leaders in the class, Professor Carl Eric Arzen from Lund University. Uh, we have a long association with Lund in this particular topic. Carl Eric is a professor in Lund, he got his PhD from there, and he also worked a lot with ABB. He has, he has been very active in embed systems and various networks of excellence in, uh, in Europe, artist too and artist design. He held uh, very uh, important positions in many of his uh, consortium associations. He's currently, you know, the uh, associate editor for Real Time Systems General and the area editor for the Labrinx uh, Transactions and Embedded Systems. He has received many awards. One of them was the Indo Car Carlos Stella Award in Manufacturing Automation. And he's also the vice chair for the IPAC uh, Technical Committee on Real Time Computing and Control between 2002 and 2004. And the uh, chair of the IPB Conversion Society Technical Committee on Real Time Control between 1999 and 2002. And he is a member of IVA, which is the uh, Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences in Sweden, the general of our National Academy of Engineering. So his talk today is going to be analysis and simulation of the better control performance using Jitterbike and two time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, this is joint work with uh, former students, most of this. You all know where Lund is, so I don't have to go through this. You know the department, uh, founded by Carl Astro, who is still there, still extremely active. We are having the offices next to each other. We have about 10 uh, faculty, uh, and I'm one of them. So uh, these are the contents for today. Uh, first, a brief on network embedded control. Then I'm going to talk about uh, three different uh, tools or techniques that one can use to analyze the temporal performance of uh, embedded control systems. The stability margin, uh, the jitterbug tools that allow you to do average case performance analysis, and true time, which is for simulation. And then I'm also going to end with the current latest development where we port true time to modality. Well, as you all know, uh, products relying on embedded control are everywhere today. And with the current focus on cyber physical systems, we have that even more. Uh, if we now look upon control loop and control loop timing, the classical control that we teach uh, assumes deterministic sampling. In most cases, periodic makes sleep life easier. Uh, if we have too long sampling interval, if, or if we have too much jitter, then we have poor performance or instability. Classical control also assumes that we have negligible or constant input-output latencies. In this case, they are constant. Uh, if the latency is small, compared to the sampling interval, we can ignore it in the design. If the latency is constant, then we can take it into account in the design. And again, if we have too long latency or too much variation in the latency, we'll have poor performance or instability. So this is kind of the, the things we teach. And this is the, th the things that we would like to achieve when we implement our controls. But sometimes, quite often, we cannot achieve this. Instead, we get timing that looks like this. We would like to sample periodically at R, K minus one, R, K, R, K plus one. Uh, but uh, the sampling doesn't take place exactly when we would like it to. It, it takes place here in the ice, and here, and here. So we will have a delay between our ideal sampling instant and the actual one. We call this a sampling delay. And then similarly, the amount of time it takes to execute the controller differs from one job to the next job. So here we do the output and, and uh, the input-output latency, the time from I to O, also varies. So we have Jitter in the input latency, jitter in the sampling uh, delay, and hence jitter in the sampling period. And this is one thing that we can obtain if we implement our controllers using small embedded, cheap, low price uh, execution platforms. Uh, maybe we have multiple tasks sharing uh, the same CPU. We have things like preemptions and blocking, variations in computation times, non-deterministic kernel primitives, all those stuff that give rise to this. 
Same thing if we have network control. If we close our control over some communication network, and then depending on what type of network and what type of protocol one uses, one can get various types of delays. Uh, transmission delays, uh, resend delays in case of collisions. And if we have wireless, we can also have those packets. So also this gives rise to this. So the question is then, how does this affect control performance? And we need tool to, to answer this. We need tool that we can use when we do design space exploration, when we do trade-off analysis. So I'm going to present uh, two tools and one technique, we can say. Uh, to begin with, if, if the delays are constant, and if we have linear systems, well then everything is straightforward. But if the delays are not constant, we have jitter in the sampling and the input output, then things are more difficult. Uh, first I'm going to speak about a, a worst case stability analysis technique that uh, assumes or requires that you have min and max values for the jitter. And if you have that, you can use these stability margin theorems developed by Calvin Winkler. So, then, if you instead of worst case would like to do an average case analysis, there is the Jitterback toolbox that assumes that you have a stochastic model of the latencies instead of the worst case values of the latencies given by some distribution function. And then, if you instead would like to simulate, then you have the true time toolbox. Uh, before I start, I want to emphasize that. Uh, Analyzing the control performance depends on quite a lot of different things, uh, and it's important to have that in mind. So it, it depends on the dynamics of the plant that we're controlling. It depends on the actual controller type. It depends on the design specs for the controller. It depends on the disturbances. It depends on the distributions of the delays. And it depends on what we mean by good performance, how, how measure, we measure this. Uh, stability margin, then. Uh, the first theorem of the, this type that was developed in our group was developed in 2004 by Cowan Lincoln. It's a uh, stability theorem where you formulate the, your plant like this. You have your, your, your system like this. You have your continuous time plant, you have your controller, and then you have a delay here. And this is, delay is arbitrarily time varying. So, you assume that we have some max value j and some min value zero, and then it can, can vary in any way whatsoever in between zero and j from one, from, from one sample to another sample, so to say. Uh, and in this setup, uh, the closed loop will, system will be stable if this thing here. Uh, question. Yeah? J is less than the intersampling time? Uh, yeah, normally it is. Normally it is. Uh, I think. Yeah, I'm not sure if actually. Yeah, let, let's assume that it is. Well, actually, it assumes a continuous time control. So you have yeah, right now it's a continuous time control. Next slide will do this good time control. So, okay. So this is the complementary sensitivity function, and this is just a, a straight line in, in the W diagram essentially. So if, if this is true for all the frequencies, well then, first of system state. So this is nice because this is a graphical interpretation. We take the Bode diagram, we draw the closed loop system uh, magnitude curve, like this, and then we have this line. I want to press the line as close as possible here, because the closer it gets, the larger the margin is. But if, if it gets below here, it's unstable. Or it might be unstable, because it's only a sufficient uh, uh, if you instead have a discrete time controller, that means the sample control case, then it's a little bit more complicated. But uh, assuming a continuous time plant, and here it is answer to your question, implicit to less than the sample period, then we get this, which is kind of similar to what we had before, uh, but here we should essentially have uh, transfer functions, taking the zero order home, sampling into account, and taking certain aliasing into account. But it is, it is very, very simple. So this you can use. It is not, well, it depends. It, it is, I mean, it's not completely non-conservative. 
there, there is some, 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 some pessimism. Uh, it only helps for linear systems, and it assumes zero sampling yield. So it really assumes that we sample periodically here. And that is a quite strong assumption. Uh, it also only uses the knowledge of the minimum and maximum uh, latencies. Assume that we know more about latencies. Well, in that case, we cannot exploit that in the analysis. But just the worst case based analysis. Which in some sense is good, because worst case means that we have some kind of worst case guarantees, which we would like to have when we have embedded systems that are safe and so on. But if we know more, then maybe we can get better results. Uh, this limitation that we have zero sampling theater was uh, relaxed uh, last year in a paper by Anton Sovin at ACC. Uh, now we instead are allowed to have variations in both the sampling and the actuation. So we have uh, the, act the sampling uh, may take place in this interval, uh, and the actuation may take place in this interval. And then we say that we have a nominal, nominal input output delay in the uh, given process. So delay could be negative? What? Delay could be negative? Uh, yeah, but it's in relation to this input output delay. So it's, I mean, it's L plus. Oh, okay, this, okay. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, the performance is uh, an H infinity type performance metric. Uh, where we essentially look upon how uh, much this, input, uh, this disturbance input signal is, is, is magnified by the system. So th this is uh, a different result, the like robustness result? Yeah. When you say it's any type? Excuse me, this is the robustness result here? When you say it's any type? It's a, it's a performance type result. Obviously. The performance here is because in H infinity, we try to bound the effect of the disturbance to certain parts of the output, right? Yeah. So that's what gamma is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what gamma is. Yes. Yeah. But you have results where you have stability of the product. Yeah, there is stability. If this goes to infinity, we have stability. It's rapid. But you have results on robustity. No, no. So here is an example. The plant could be an inverted pendulum, I guess. Controller, probably some kind of PIPID type controller sampling interval and the, so to say, nominal delay. And here we see the output jitter on this axle, axis, the input jitter on this axis, and we see the value of this uh, uh, gamma here. And we see that if we have too large, large outputs or too large input jitter, we will get it. So here is our kind of stability in this case. But we can, we can be anywhere below here and have a stable system. Actually, in there, the jitter is now it seems to be big enough to be out of predictor. L is 0.08, so the jitter is an additional 0.14 in either direction. Uh, just looking for up or right, L is 0.08. Yeah, right. So, 0 0.08. so it seems strange to have a jitter that is larger than 0.08. Agree, agree. agree. I, I haven't done this example. So the, the zero could be in the middle. What? Could it be that zero could be in the middle? It should be in the middle. It doesn't really matter. The problem is with the, with the plus or not. Oh, it's, oh, oh, no, it's okay. So 0.14, then you divide by 2, so it's uh, 0.07. So you're just okay. I was worried about your, your getting it. Yeah, that's correct. You divide by 2. Yeah, so yeah, it's just okay. yes, 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 Okay, uh, so this you can use. Uh, that's the, a more theoretical result. The next thing you can use is this uh, toolbox jitterbug. So this is a toolbox that was uh, developed originally in 2002 by the same uh, uh, people, Lincoln and Serving. Uh, it's a MATLAB-based toolbox for stochastic analysis of control performance. Uh, where the delays are uh, described by distribution functions. Uh, we assume that we have a system that is disturbed by white noise, noise and we assume that the performance is measured by some uh, quadratic cost function, where we uh, could penalize the state and the state and the control signal. And, so. and a small 
value of the cost function <coughs> is good performance, and if the cost function is unstable, it is if it's infinity, then we will have an unstable. So, using this toolbox, you can evaluate the effects of uh, uh, gain latencies, <coughs> gain rate latencies, lost samples, aborted computations, and how that affects uh, control performance. We can also analyze jitter compensating controllers. There is some limited uh, support for analyzing apparatus controllers and, and moderate controllers. And this is really just a, a packaging of uh, already available theory for linear quadratic Gaussian systems and jump linear systems. So this is really old, old stuff that has been packaged. So in here to back, you describe your system by uh, a number of connected uh, blocks of transit functions. And they can be continuous time, typically representing the plant, or discrete time, typically representing the computing and, and sensing and actuating and so on. And these are then driven by white noise. So here, this could be a, a model for a network control loop. You have a plant, you have the sensor in one node, you have a controller in another, another node communicating over a network, and you have the actuator in a third node communicating over the same network. So that is kind of the system, the blocks. Then the temporal uh, information is modeled by an automaton. Uh, so here you have states corresponding to uh, different executions of the discrete time uh, control blocks. So it's essentially here in, in state one, which is the initial state, double circles, we will execute H1. And H1 was the sampling, the sensing. Then there will be a delay given by this <coughs> H, and then in the next state we will execute H2, which was our controller. Uh, and then again we will have another delay, and then in the final state we will execute the actuator. Uh, and then the delays, they are represented by discrete probability distributions, where we have a, a resolution given by this delta, which kind of is the granularity count. And this affects uh, the complexity of the analysis, how long time and how much memory we use. Uh, so that was the model of a network control loop. There is another model where we just model the, the sampling delay and the input-output delay in a control loop executing on some microcontroller. So here, from the sampling, which takes place here, we have the sampling delay, and then we do this, the sampling here, and we have another delay, input-output delay, and here we ex execute the controller and, and send out the control signal. So P is the process, S is the sampler, and K is the combined controller and actuator. And this is how this looks, the coming two slides is how this looks like in Jitterbug or in NASA code. Jitterbug doesn't have any graphical interface. So it's essentially just a bunch of uh, MATLAB commands. Uh, first, you define your first uh, delay probability distribution for that. And if we set that to one, it will correspond to zero delay. Then we say, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we define our second delay distribution, then we initialize Jitterbug with a certain time grain corresponding to the delta and should be a periodic system with period H. Then we add the different timing nodes, so we add the timing node 1, uh, and then there is a delay, delay given by Pita 1 to timing node 2, and so on. We add second timing node, third timing node. And then we add the different transfer function. We add the continuous time transfer function, and then we say that uh, it should be connected in certain ways, and we have the, 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 the cost function Q here, and uh, input and output uh, noise covariances, R1 and R2. And then we add the discrete time system. So this is the sampler, we add the controller, and so on. And then we calculate the complete dynamics for this, and then we calculate We're going to run a simple demo here where we will have essentially uh, an example where we don't assume that we have any sampling in the year. We have a perfect sampling and then we have an input output delay and then we do the 
how to put the calculations in there. So, uh, I will go to MATLAB. Uh, here is the simple MATLAB script. It's even called simple. We define the process, P, uh, continuous time input noise, discrete time measurement noise, uh, the continuous uh, cost function, the Q matrix. So we penalize uh, a lot on the output and a little bit on the state. Sampling period, H. And then tau here is the assumed input output delay. That is the, what we believe the delay is when we do the control design. The sampler is just one, so it's ideal sampling. And then we design an LGG uh, controller. with the same cost function, with the same noise and so on, with the period and with the assumed uh, delay. Okay, and then we, we uh, play around with this. So, so let's begin with saying that we have a zero delay. So this is uh, zero input. So this is the ideal case. And what will then the cost be? 0 0.2591. Okay, what does this mean? Absolutely nothing. This is just a number. It doesn't tell you anything. But if you then compare this, what you will get if you change something. Let's say that we, instead of having zero, uh, one, uh, zero delay, we have a one sample delay. And I will actually get this by changing a little bit here. So. Okay, save. So now, now we have a full sample delay. And now we've got infinity. So now it's unstable. So with a full sample delay, it's unstable. Okay, but if we now take the full sample delay into account in the control design, we augment the process model with, with, uh, with this. This is still unstable. I actually don't know myself. No, it's not unstable, but it's, uh, yeah. It has almost a three times larger cost. And then we can continue, continue like this. Okay, go back to assuming that we don't have any delay and see what will the cost function be if we have half a, a sample's uh, constant delay. Okay. Okay, so that's that. Well, we can play around with non-constant delay. Say that we want to have a, a distribution. So now we have a, a uniform distribution between zero and one sample. And we can see what that is. So it's that. Quite a lot, but not unstable. So we can play around with different distribu distributions here and see how it affects control performance. Uh, and what you typically do is that you, oops. <laughs> what you typically do here is that you, uh, you uh, de derive these types of curves. So this could be something where you have a cost on this axis, here, here maybe you have something that has to do with the sampling period, and here you might have to do, have something that has to do with the, with the latency. And then based on this, you can see, okay, assuming that we think that this amount of cost is okay, that this will then give us a region which we can use in, in our design to, to relax the specifications on perfect sampling and so on. So, so that is the intention for, for, for using this. Tool. Then we can have more complicated cases. Uh, in, the temp, in the automaton, we can have random choice of path. Here. We can also have, have a choice of path that depends on the delay from the start, so to say. And we can have update equations in the different nodes that are a function of the actual delays. So we can have implement uh, uh, delay compensation and see how that, uh, 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 what performance you get out of that. And then we can have our periodic system. 
So uh, the normal thing uh, that Jitterbug used is used for S4 periodic system. You calculate the costs, you get an analytical solution, it is reasonably fast. Uh, but you can also use it for operating system. But this is somewhat experimental. It's an iterative computation with possibly very slow convergence. Internally, it works like this. It's, we sample the continuous time system, we sample the noise, we sample the cost function with this time grain, translate the timing model into a Markov chain, and then we formulate the closed loop system as a discrete time jump linear system, where the transition matrix and uh, the, this covariance depends on the Markov state. And then we compute the stationary co covariance uh, using this. And the complexity, each continuous time system of order n gives rise to n internal states. Each discrete time system of order n gives rise to n plus 1 internal states. Uh, we get the stationary covariance matrix by solving a linear system of equation n squared where n is the total number of internal states coming from these discrete and continuous time blocks. And the amount of memory required is this, where n is the same thing as before. m is the number of nodes in our timing automata, and m is the number of time steps per period. So that has to do with this graph data. Mm -hmm. Pros and cons of this, it gives you analytical performance computation. It is reasonably fast to evaluate for a wide range of parameters. Uh, and it guarantees stability in the mean square sense if the cost is finite. The negative things, simplistic timing models, uh, delays are independent. That's a fairly severe uh, limitation. We cannot say that this delay and this delay, they should sum to the same, same value. And also, the delay distributions, they may not change. They are constant. Also, only linear systems, only quadratic costs. We have to have knowledge about the latency distributions and where should we get them. I mean, if we try to use, for instance, scheduling theory, that at best can give us worse and less case values. And then finally, it's a statistical analysis. The cost is an expected cost. We cannot guarantee that we will get this cost in every particular case. Uh, and all, all results have a mean, that's mean value set. So if we want to use this as some kind of argument in some kind of formal verification process, the certification uh, bodies are maybe not so happy. But still, uh, as control engineers, I know we, we do work a lot with statistical approaches, so we know that. And then timing scenarios with probability zero, they are not covered by this analysis. For instance, if you, had, if you in my previous example had uh, a deterministic switching between zero delay, one sample delay, zero delay, one sample delay, that would not be covered by this, because that would not, that would have, have a probability zero. So that we cannot take into account. When you say expected value, this is really expected value. You don't have uh, handle on variance either. No, no. no. So this switching is actually important because there could be some a fraction of the Yes. When you, when you, when you, uh, this, you call the system simply to switch from one control performance to another, you can make the bait. Yep. You can make the one different. Yep. Yep. If, if you know how to switch. So. OK, then the final tool is true time then. And this, that is uh, a simulator that we started developing in 99. And that was because at that time, we had PhD students that started look, looking upon the interference between the control implementation and the performance, if you implemented a controller using some real-time operating system and so on, what would will the uh, performance be out of this? And I then put up as a challenge uh, that it would be extremely good if we could simulate this in some way. Simulate the effects of a real-time kernel with tasks and preemptions and, and so on, uh, using some simulator. And then uh, Johan Eker, one of my PhD students, he did the first version of this in, uh, in simu for simulating. And this we have then continuously de developed. And uh, by now we have something called version 2.0, a fairly large user base, and it's available under GPL. So the idea is to embed models of, uh, of real time kernels, real time CPUs, and real time networks as blocks within Simulink. 
And to those blocks, you can connect signals and so on in a normal way. And, and inside the blocks, you have code representing the, the tasks and the interrupt handlers and so on. So we can uh, uh, simulate with time kernels and, and different types of programs. Uh, if we want to model computations, well, we do that by writing tasks in these true time kernel blocks. So these block simulates an event-based kernel, executes tasks and interrupt handlers, either written in C++ or as MATLAB M files. Uh, you can have there are support for a certain predefined scheduling policies, but you can also easily define your own scheduling policy. And there are support for all the common real-time primitives that you typically find in uh, real-time operating systems, communication, for time handling, and so on. Uh, you write your code structured in a special way. So this is a code for uh, some general controller, and it is split up into segments. For each segment, you have code statements, and then you have the, so to say, time this is assumed to take to execute this. And this time is a design parameter. That is something you, you yourself uh, enter. And it could be deterministic, it could be stochastic, it could be whatever. And that's the time to execute? That's the time to execute. In, in simulate, of course, this executes instantaneously, but it's the time, so it can be assumed that this computation is taking place. I mean, this is simulation. <coughs> we don't never exceed the time. It takes, in, in reality, it takes zero time to execute this. Okay. Or, or sorry, in, in the simulation, it takes zero time to execute this. We 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 only say that okay, it, it should take two. It, it, it takes two milliseconds. And then in the next segment, we uh, we we do the sending out the, the uh, output signal and so on. We say that this takes four milliseconds. So this That's is. That. Is that only for simulations? But I thought we can actually use this for design effects. True time is for simulation. It's not for design. So whatever you learn here can you transfer it to real time design or not? Oh yeah, yeah, of course you can. I mean because the the, the the interesting thing is that for this event phase, right? Yeah. I, I could actually that's question can you actually use this to design? A controllers that have to operate partly on samples, partly on event based. Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Right. But yeah. then, then come back to my question: If you do this, and in reality, because of the interactions between blocks, the population may cause may actually exceed the limit. Then what happens? You interrupt or you do it again? Yeah, again. I mean, this is a model right. of the computation. In the model, we assume, I mean, we assume that this takes a certain amount of time. And when we get this amount? We assume that it, we, we assume that this takes two milliseconds. I guess there's another way to get it. Well, they, they run it, it takes a certain time, but, but they, they forget about the time too. Well, that's by itself. Yeah, okay, yeah. It, it, it did take two milliseconds. Yeah, that's by itself. But there, there is another issue. Which is this business of race conditions? You know, would it catch a race error? Uh, if we have right. one segment per statement, it will catch race conditions. One okay. segment per statement. You can have these segments; they can be right, so, big so, or small. Okay, so but 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 there could be a race condition that depends on multiple segments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it wouldn't catch those. Uh, That's what you just said. No, I would claim we catch those. If okay, we good. Let me ask you this yep. different time. When you put this number down, to your point of view, yep. when you get them from? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Maybe you get them from some worst case execution time analysis. Right, that's what I'm getting. Yep. 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 Because if I want to use this for design, yep. I have to put some variables. You have to put some. So they some reflect something that yep. I want to do in the area of system. Yep. Can okay, this actually another question is has anybody interfaced this with a scheduler? I mean why I'm asking because one of the things that I am interested in this is can I use this for network protocol design? So presentation network protocol design. You can design you can use this for testing your new fancy network protocol. Because and you can implement it in in, in this in this and, and run it and test it. Yes. Because there it, why this is an answer application is because the hardware, you will be very level standardized. Mm -hmm. You can have a lot of 
information about it. But then people are now interested to create more virus twists in yeah. the protocols. Yeah. For instance, one that recently has appeared with an application is I want to modify slightly my wild network protocols to be able to account for uncertainties that they, are, they may be due to attacks or some discovery. Right? Yeah. And the question is, how do you modify? What do you modify to be robust against this kind of thing? Right? I, will, I will explain. I mean, yeah. how, so, so how, how do we model net networks? Yeah. Well, we, we model them as a network block. Okay. This block has support for a number of built-in oh, protocols. Okay. Uh, what it really is internally is a discrete event simulator. Yeah. And that is exactly the same as this. This is also a discrete event simulator. This is a discrete event simulator. And it's open source code. So you can, based on yeah. the models available, yeah. you can modify these or add your own. Yeah. Uh, so another question I have is, has this anybody interface this with system C? No, I don't think so. So I can do, you know, hardware, software? No, I don't think so. Uh, the, the thing we model is the, the MAC delay and the transmission delay. No, that, that's the essential yeah. things that we model. Then we have the wireless networks. We support uh, the 11.4 PG and 15.4. Uh, and wireless hot has been implemented right. by ABP for this. We haven't done it ourselves. So this part of the general license that we get? Well, it's hard, it's not, but ABB would like it to be, so it's possible to get it. Possible to be? Yeah. yeah. And then the wireless network, as early as human, two dimensional world. So, yeah, the input to this network book is, of course, the, the true positions of the different nodes, but we assume two dimensions, X and Y. But it could be very easily extended to three dimensions. Uh, the radio model is a very simple model with an exponential platform. But if if you have uh, some uh, more advanced model, you can plug it in. It is possible to plug it in. So here is an example of a network control loop. You are controlling this uh, Simulink uh, block, which is uh, some kind of a mechanical servo. You have this controller doing the uh, sensing, sending it to this controller doing the control calculation, calculations, sending it back to this doing the actuation. And then you have the network. And here you can look upon the, the, the typical things that we look upon as control engineers. How, how is the, the, the output, the, some kind of step response signal? We can look upon the control signals. But we can also look upon the schedule of the tasks in the different CPUs, in the different kernels. So here we have tasks running in some, some kernel. And we can look upon the network schedule. The different nodes, are they sending? Are they uh, uh, backing off due to collision? I guess if you had, let's say, 10 controllers running on 10 robots, right? Yeah. And you had a wire that you were connecting them. Yeah. And you could use this to simulate how they will operate. Absolutely. You could look at these schedules and, yep. and, and, and see. You will actually see a demo of that. For its node, right? So I can see how well they're doing and all that. That's nice. Uh, I'm going to run a demo exactly of this. Uh, so. So this is uh, similar to what I said before. Here you have the, the plant that we are controlling. We have one CPU that does both the sensing and the actuation. So this is kind of an I/O CPU. Then we have one CPU executing the controller. We have the network here. And we have one uh, CPU acting as an interfering uh, node, communicating on the same network. So uh, let's see. This looks like. So now we, we see the, the classical things that we are used to see. So this the reference signal is a step signal or a square wave signal. It, it looks fairly okay. This is the control signal. Now we can also have a look upon, uh, for instance, uh, the tasks. That Executing in this IO node. So uh, they are available here. 
they are executing extremely, extremely periodically and nice. So this is, uh, one of them is the sensor, and another is the actuator task. Okay, you can have a look upon what's happening on the, on the network. And uh, we have two nodes using the network, the, the sensor actuator node that sends to the controller node, and the controller node that sends back to the sensor actuator node. Now we can add some disturbances here. First thing we will add is that we will add a uh, high priority task executing in the controller node. High priority task having higher priority than uh, the controller task. And did you allow it that? Oh yeah, this is preemptive. Oh yes. So, uh, and now we don't remember how it looked like the last time, but uh, the overshoots are actually somewhat larger. But still, it is it is it is acceptable performance. Uh, we can have a look now on the in the schedule for the controller, and uh, now we see that here we have uh, two tasks. This one here is the periodic high priority disturbance task runs perfectly. Deterministic, so to say, and but it will then uh, preempt the controller task. So the controller task will be preempted, and we will have variations in the delays. Uh, now we can do the same thing by adding some uh, interfering traffic on the network. So we, let's say that this this node here generates traffic that occupies 30% of the bandwidth bandwidth on the on the network. What happens then? So these are the things you can typically play around with using uh, using. Uh, okay, let's continue. I'm going to. You, you talked about mobile robots and so on, and uh, I'm going to end my presentation with this. Uh, okay. This is just a slide telling that we support Monte Core, we support uh, uh, virtual processors, bandwidth reservation techniques in, in the models. So this is a this true time mobile robotics was done in a European project, uh, and this part was done at the end. So this was done in 2007. It's a project called Runas, coordinated by Ericsson, and in that project, the project looked upon. Uh, communication in general, if one can almost say. And uh, it had a big scenario, and the big scenario was uh, tunnel road safety. Assume that you have some road tunnel uh, below Baltimore or in the Alps or something, and then you have a crash. We assume that we have a stationary sensor network in this road tunnel for measuring things like uh, temperature to, to detect fires and so on. Uh, and we also assume that we have a, a, a fixed uh, wired network. Uh, and then we assume that there is a, some accident happens in the tunnel, the fire starts, the, mo the, the stationary ne wired, wired network uh, goes down, the, the wireless network goes down due to some of these nodes are being down, 
And then we have mobile robots acting as mobile gateways sent in to restore the connectivity in the web center, to make it able, possible to get out the data, essentially. Of course, this is a highly uh, idealized uh, situation. But still. So uh, these uh, wireless robots, they uh, uh, use uh, ultrasound-based localization using triliteration techniques. Uh, uh, so each robot broadcasts a radio packet and an ultrasound pulse simultaneously, and then based on the difference in time of arrival, they, they know the distance to the robot, they send this back to the robot, and the robot combines this using with uh, uh, photometry to calculate its position using an extended column of the picture. Uh, so we have these robots we should implement, it should, it should work, and we have a quite challenging verification problem. I mean, we have robots with, with several microprocessors, they were actually five Atmel AVR microprocessors on this one, and one uh, sensor network node. <laughs> then we have sensor network radio communication, IEEE. Uh, we have a, a routing, uh, 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 ad hoc routing protocol, called ALDV, uh, that we would like to work verify this. We have the ultrasound pad localization. We have infrared based obstacle avoid avoidance, and then we have all the control and estimation running. How on earth should we verify this? Can we verify this formally? Probably not. Can we try to see how it works with simulation? Yes, we can, uh, using uh, true time. So we use true time in parallel with the development of the real system to see how it would work. So uh, here is the Runes tunnel scenario model. We have six wireless sensor nodes. One, two, three, four, five, and this sixth in the gateway. We have a number of robots. We have a radio network and we have an ultrasound network. We model the, 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 the ultrasound essentially as a network. And then we have animation. If we open up <coughs> the sensor network nodes, in reality they look like this. And inside we have a Telos uh, node. Uh, if we open up well, the robot, these they are not they are not so nice. They're quite ugly, actually. Uh, looks like this. Uh, a lot of uh, microcontrollers and stuff. And uh, this is an infrared sensor that kind of do like this all the time to check for obstacles. This is the <coughs> the the, the, the ultra node uh, uh, transmitter, uh, ultrasound transmitter. Does it have a squeegee on the front? What? What does it have? A, a, a squeegee on the front? Mm -hmm. uh, this, water. Yeah. This is just uh, bumper. Yeah, bumper. <laughs> no, not for water. Right? So, okay. So if if we go out, go in in the robot, we will find uh, a model of Team of Sky acting as the radio interface and bus master and and uh, uh, robot controller runs there. We have uh, one AVR Mega 128 that acts as a compute engine interface to the infrared. And there we have the Kalman filter, navigation and obstacle avoidance logic being running. We have uh, one separate AVR Mega 16 as the ultrasound interface. There is communication between these using an I2C bus. And then if we open up the, the wheel and motors, there we have one, two more additional AVR Mega 16, one for each wheel motor. And uh, very simple motor models and a very simple dual drive unicycle robot dynamic. Then we have an animation, so here is the tunnel. We have the robot going in, and uh, you will see that now. <coughs> so the verification here was done after the fire? It was done in parallel. The fire was the design, yeah. before, before the design? No, in parallel. Why couldn't it be before the design? We didn't. It was, you know, a European project. I mean, it's not. I'm familiar with Runes. I'm actually tracking it. They're going to be covered by that. Yeah. That's what the question I've been asking. I think it's true that you were doing it. Try a narrow way. Design something you see. It's not the best way, right? No, sure. So, uh,
get this spectacular movie that you can use for reception. <laughs> so that one. Okay, so here you have it. I can click on this and open up what I want to do it, but instead I will run this. Okay, so, so down below here you have the you have the animation pane. Uh, so this is the entrance to the tunnel, and this is uh, deep down in the tunnel. Here you have some sensor. Uh, let's say it's a temperature sensor. This value here has been updated, and then it is being sent using uh, multi hop out to the this gateway now. And you see that this changes, and then you get, and then you see this kind of fades away. So this fades away if we don't have any measurements coming out. This is an obstacle, and this is the road. Okay, now let's uh, turn off uh, so two of the sensor nodes. Obstacle will be an accident or fire? Yeah, let, let's, let's say that there is a fire, and let's turn off, uh, turn off these two. Uh, so now, this one fades away here. These two are turned off, and uh, we don't get any uh, data out. So, uh, what should we do? Well, we should send in the, the mobile robot. So we do that. Let's send in the mobile robot. Okay, now the mobile robot starts. And you see, it is the black thing. But behind it, there is a shadow image, a gray one. The gray one is the robot's internal uh, belief where he is. And then there is uh, this uh, uh, obstacle, and soon it will detect the obstacle, and then it will start turn. And this is an extremely simple and stupid obstacle uh, avoidance. So it's uh, shattering. Oh, there is an obstacle. I have to turn. Oh, there is no obstacle. I turn back. Oh, so it goes like this. It's not an optimistic scenario for a tunnel problem. It's very optimistic. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And uh, my machine is not the, the fastest one either. So, uh, did they consider flying the robot in? No, not at that time. UAVs were not that fancy as in 2005. In smoke, how in smoke? Well, well, the problem is that you know uh, on the pavement is way worse. I mean, I've got a chance of getting a robot in through the you know through the air. But no chance at all through you know the wreckage and all of that. But well, if you see the real movie, they yeah. made. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, there is the, the real the movie is there. Actually. And then some of the small autographs. I mean, they, because you cannot, there's no chance you can send that link to the post. So, so the the robot is. We we try to reconnect the node. The the, the robot. Using some magic, uh, using some magic, the robot knows which sensors are uh, broken down, and it, it goes to a predefined position in the simulation. Okay. Uh, but I don't really know what it's doing right now. <laughs> it got stuck. Ah, now we, now we, well, start again. So let's see where we should. I guess the thing is that this, actually I think I have turned off the wrong, it could be that I have turned off, no, no I have turned off the right one, it's trying to get there, as soon as, soon as this circle goes up above 5, then AOD, the AODV protocol will automatically, uh, because there is a node on the robot too, there is a sensor. Yeah, we've done things like this for UAVs, where you have ground vehicles and humans, but they move and all of a sudden they use they lose communication. Then you can bring a bunch of EMVs to become delay not delay. delay. Ah, now we don't value really okay. so, okay. so that this was kind of okay. Uh, so here is quite a lot of different stuff being seen. So the robot the same robot here is to become a relay now. Yeah, relay now. But the, the, the important thing is that there is exactly the same, not exactly, but in, in some cases, exactly the same code being run in the trip time simulator as being run in the real world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. uh, and in the case where it's not exactly the same, it is very similar. Okay. 
So then I will just finish the model of this. Oh, should I run the demo? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I would need like five minutes. Okay. Okay. So here you, you see the tunnel. You see the broken down cars and trucks. Uh, you see the sensor network nodes on the side here. And you see uh, down here the robot. And it behaves exactly as stupid as it did in the simulation. <laughs> and that's it all. And fantastically enough, it can drive through the this fire. big fire without... <laughs> that's not so bad. You could sense the fire and think it is an obstacle? And, and in the audience, we had a European project officers, right. and we even had firefighters from the local fire station. And what did they say? Oh, they thought it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it avoided the truck, and it will avoid this one too. And then when it reaches here somewhere, it will the, the relaying of updates. There is another tunnel going in this direction. Actually. Because you could have uh, temperature sensors. Yeah. To localize the fire. Yeah. Is an obstacle. Sure. Sure. You can even uh, you know that see if it's standard or not. Yeah. Okay. Then the final thing. Third time I'm going to Just uh, three slides. Uh, in Simulink, uh, we base the implementation of third time on the S functions. So the, both the kernels and the networks are, are written in the S functions, and in the S functions we implement discrete event simulators. Uh, the task code is C or C++ or M5. Uh, we are current, or we have been, in, being in the process of porting TrueTime to Videlica for a while now. The network parts, oh, they, that, they are already available. The network parts, there is a native Modelica version available that should run on uh, any... That's for open Modelica? Should run for open Modelica, we haven't tested it, but it's only the networks, not the hackers. And that is being implemented in, in, in more elegant code okay. right away. No, no, no C code, right? And now we have a, a version done using the support for external C code for in Dynamo. Mm -hmm. But we would like to do it in, in full true time. And the nice thing is that since uh, two years, maybe, there is something called FMIs, right. the Flexible Mockup Interface, which is an open source, non proprietary model exchange format very similar to S functions. It is essentially built upon S functions to, to have something similar. So you can, the idea is to use it uh, to, if, if you have some, some, some tool, and then you can encapsulate some model as an FMU, and then you can use, execute that model in whatever tool you have, or you, that's, that supports FMU, the FMI interface. So FMU is flux, flux, flexible mockup unit. There is also support for code simulation. You can uh, embed also the solver in the, the, this. And uh, in, in this implementation, kernels and networks are then FMIs. And that means that you can use the Modelica tools, Dynola, Open Modelica, J Modelica, but also non Modelica tools that uh, follow the FMI standard. The task code is written in C, and this is work, process, work in progress. Uh, unfortunately, it has been stalled somewhat. This is work together with Janusz Stefanowicz, uh, and they have this big DARPA adaptive vehicle main Gimeta 2 program, where the idea is that they should develop a tool chain for uh, mechanical psychophysical systems uh, based upon their existing tool chain that was based on simulating tools. And in that tool chain, they had already the simulating tool time which they used for, for evaluating controllers and taking the, the, the temporal the things into account. But in the, in the new DARPA ABM program, they were not allowed to use uh, non-open uh, source uh, tools. So they decided to switch to Modelica completely. And then they also wanted to have uh, uh, true time in the Modelica environment. So, so we set up a, a common project uh, with, uh, with the idea to, to port true time to uh, this uh, meta two challenge. And uh, we, we are about halfway through. What has happened, I don't know, but they had originally extreme big problems with, with Modelica. Uh, 
uh, they tried to do it in, in Open Modelo, they selected Open Modelica. Uh, the, the models derived by their uh, uh, the companies in this consortium, they were way too complex to be allowed to be simulated. So they had to have, have set up a contract with Modelon to make simpler models that still could could give good results but were much faster to see. So that so that, that, that I mean everyone that really knows where they can knows that there is a big threshold. It is a substantial threshold. Uh, and uh, they were perhaps not really aware of that. Now they are aware of it. But the, the thing I don't because I'm very aware of the project yeah. I don't understand really why they they have to run everything on complex models at the same time scale and same time scale. Why do they run that I don't know. use model? That I don't know. Then it wouldn't be a problem. That I don't know. So, so we have a, a kind of a running version for the kernels in the NFMIs, nothing for the networks yet. So, what is Modelon doing exactly? Modelon have contracts with Janos, taking the models coming from Ricardo yeah. and uh, Making them practically usable. So that you can reduce the dimensions of the model. Yeah, re yeah, reduce the dimension of the model, the order of the model, uh, maybe some nonlinear things to, to make it. So that's one thing. And then I also believe they have a new contract to uh, implement support for the uh, multi body model uh, library. Okay. Yeah, in general. In general? Yeah. So Janus would want to have. Right, essentially, not only open but they want to. It's, I mean, they didn't dare to put all their eggs in one basket. Yeah. But we are very much interested in the model that they were very much Yeah. And in particular, I'm looking for the end of the world. Yeah. That's our main first application for them. Okay, so, yeah, we have a guy working for Janos, the Swedish guy who's working for Janos, but he's not working on this. I think he should, but of course I understand the analysis has the more intelligent. Yeah, it was just a meeting which we read in that. Yeah. 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 And they are all available for free download uh, from our web page. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? I'm glad that some of you who will work on your problems are here. So, questions? So, I have a question. When you say verification, you mean verification against some real situation as different than validation of the model, is that correct? Uh, I mean, when I say verification, I mostly mean the typical form of verification. I mean, uh, the implementation verifying that the implementation uh, needs the model text, that's it. Okay. But I mean... Uh, Unless the specs include worst case disasters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you try to draw a line between validation and verification. Okay. Validation basically for us means that you do model checking and things like that to make sure the software is uh, conforming with the requirements of the software. Validation, verification is more like when I either try to to satisfy, prove that my simulations or other things, you know, satisfy my requirements and so on and so forth, or I do real experiments. Yeah. So. Somehow they're not the same. No, no. Both are necessary. Uh, I'm going to just show you this. Uh, next week, actually, right. several of the people that were at CPS Week are coming to Loon for a workshop on form of verification. So, uh, yeah, a lot of the. Have a budget left. You're most welcome to the Who? Andras is the head of LCCC, yeah. yeah. I'm responsible yeah. for this workshop. LCCC is a, a 10 year program that we have got from the Swiss government, uh, which we, we have run for almost five years now.
Yes. Uh, may I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, in the jitterbug uh, part, if the if there is more than one delay, and uh, since the delay has a distribution, um, is that possible? The total delay is greater than the sampling here, and and if that could be, how could you simulate the whole thing? I I, I cannot really answer that because I should. You know, I would like to forward that <laughs> question to the guy who really implemented it. I, I oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I just think it is possible since you have distribution and more than one delay, so the total delay could be more than the. I think, I think it can be, but I, I won't 100%. Yeah, yes, yes. Swear on it. Yeah. And, and there, uh, another question is that the, about the uh, true time part. Yes. I mean, uh, is that possible we give her external or interrupt? Since if, you, if I just want to. Uh, simulate the network uh, protocol or something, and we have a specified uh, controller, which is I don't know how to sim simulate in C code or MATLAB code, but we have the uh, the, the true machine, the hardware. Yeah. And is it possible to connect the hardware external interrupt to simulate it? Uh, yes and no. I mean uh, uh, the 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 nodes. The true time nodes, they have uh, the kernel, so to say, the kernel. They have uh, an input which is an external interrupt input. Similar as, as a as a real microcontroller can take external inputs. We can we can have external have external uh, interrupts. We we have support for external interrupts. I see. But if you want to use it in some kind of hardware in the loops situation, what you can do is that you can actually get simulating to run in in real time kind of you, as, assuming that sim simulated time is faster than real time you can always slow down the execution so that it follows uh, real time or, yeah. or clock time that's possible and then if you have some way of communicating between your controller and simulink then you can get it together but it, it, it all depends on the time scale in some sense but, I mean technically it is, it is possible yeah. I mean, we have even used uh, this true time to control a physical lab process by simply having this running in Simulink, having uh, IO blocks in Simulink connecting to the physical world, and then slowing it down so it, 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 it runs in real time. So it's, it's possible. Yeah, well, this is a real time workshop. So it seems like it's just quite a C code for you. Mm. Yeah, but uh, not for true time. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Well, you go through FMI, do you have any experience with the exact code? Is it going to have any uh, slowness or any other counter? Uh, I know I have not, nothing effects? to say. Uh, You're not using FMI things. on the DAPA project? Uh, in the DAPA project, they are not using yeah. FMI as I It's just Modelica. I know. Just Modelica. Yeah, it's just Modelica. Yeah. And uh, in, in the first competition, I believe it's. I'm not even sure it's open with a link. Very well be done. I'm not 100% sure. I think it's that one. Uh, uh, none of the important I want to know. What do you know about mm -hmm. uh, to what extent that, that first uh, delay condition you gave is necessary? Because it, you know, oh, it's, it's, it's sufficient. It's not necessary. No, I know it's sufficient. Mm -hmm. it's like, and, uh, but if it's even it close to necessary, it means you can't actually do uh, zero space data and control. Uh, you have to change the program. Uh, no, it can't. Uh, it basically says it can't be because you know you could you, you know you can tolerate small amounts of jitter in a regular control problem. Here. So uh, I think I think it depends on, on, on the actual yeah, system. So. It's it's based on small gain theorem. Yeah, but remember he has a he has a condition on the sampling. Right. Uh, so you change the sampling. That's what I mean. If it doesn't work, it tells you something about the design. That's why I prefer to do this thing before the actual experiment with this. Anyway, another question I have is when when things are linear, even if they're sweets, right? When I try to do difficult problems in validation or verification, let's say, right? Does this work of, for that matter that you scroll is using and others? And most of the time, uh, you can turn the problem of uh, validation and verification, as long as your, 
your requirements are transferred to some sort of a constraint and you set sort of a constraint value which is convex and so on and so forth. Actually, a convex programming exercise. Mm. This is very useful because you can actually run it. Very sure. Fast. Sure. Do you, you use any of these? No, we haven't used any of these. Because I know, I know this you have when uh, Suzanne there, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Very much. Well, most of this work was kind of was done. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you again. Yeah.